Well, good morning. Say that back to me. Good morning. In the past couple of weeks, I've been doing this. Uh, I say, hey, Harvest. You say, hey, back. Hey, Harvest. Hey. So good to celebrate with you in this place. And uh, the Lord has good in store for us today. And I'm going to tell you, uh, just a little warning, uh, the, the scripture is really straightforward today and saying, watch out. So get ready for it. In fact, let's get ready to be in God's word together. Uh, if you're new with us, we do this each week. We get into the Bible. And so if you have a Bible, would you take it out? Would you uh, be ready to uh, go into God's word and be ready to learn in this place? It's not opinion hour. In fact, we're going to be in in the second half of your Bible and find the book of Colossians, the letter to the church in Colossae, that is modern day Turkey, where Colossae is located, and you can find it. Always use that uh, table of contents to get to someplace quickly. It's there for us. Uh, in fact, I, I always just say it's right there. Find the table of contents, find Colossians, uh, get to it. Some of you love to use the notes, and so I'm going to our app right now, and I look at Sundays, and I look at notes, and I click that open, and it's all there for you as well. You can take notes and then email yourself uh, following the message and uh, just review what God has been speaking into our lives today, and he does have a very clear message for us. Before we go any further, though, I want you to recognize where we're going to end up today. We're going to end up by celebrating communion, and uh, there are the elements uh, laid out for us. This is where we will end up, and so I, I look just right now at the camera. If you're watching online, uh, make sure you're ready and prepared to celebrate communion with us. So last week, uh, if you weren't with us, last week uh, we were in the book of Colossians together, and the sermon title was this, Be Secure. Be Secure, two words. And both of them, both of those words, verbs, action-oriented. Be is that present tense. Be, be continually, be in this moment. Be, be, be secure. That is where we're going to go. Secure, the second word, has this understanding to it. In fact, uh, I'm just going to read it. Meaning to fix or attach firmly so that it cannot be moved or lost. lost. Be secure, but also has this understanding. Secure protecting against threats. So verb and verb, be secure. That's what we want for every follower of Jesus. We want you to be secure in your faith. In fact, we used this comparison last week of two different types of plants. One is the tumbleweed. I saw a tumbleweed this week, and I was like, there it was. There it is. I took a picture of it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> like, I took a picture of a tumbleweed at the park, and my wife is just shaking her head. I'm like, whatever. Who does that? I'm like, that's what I'm talking about. You see, even a mature tumbleweed is easily tossed and moved by the wind, the winds of culture, the winds of a new thought, the winds of... Oh, somebody just being uh, difficult, uh, hard on you, and that you're moved by it, a tumbleweed. The opposite of that is really the secure understanding. In fact, I showed a picture of the grove of the patriarchs, these massive trees that really say, bring on the wind, bring on the snow, bring on the volcanoes exploding, bring them, and we will stand. I love that. That's the picture of a secure Christian roots down deep in Jesus, their faith secure. That's what we want for every one of us, that we would be secure in our faith in Jesus. He's the one who saves. He's the one who protects us. He's the one who guides us and leads us. Be secure in knowing that Jesus loves you. Listen, if nobody else told you this week that you are loved, I want you to hear it right now, that Jesus Christ has declared he loves you, and he's backed up his words with action, and he's demonstrated how much he loves you by coming for us, living the perfect life, that his body was broken. We will celebrate that in communion, that his blood was poured out, bringing us a new covenant, a new way of living, new life. Be secure in knowing who Jesus is. Be secure in knowing what he's done. Two words, be secure. That was last week. Now, this week is one word, and that word is beware beware. Beware. It sounds like perfect word for Halloween, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, oh man, beware. Beware. Beware of zombies. Woo, thank you for warning me. Uh, beware of ghosts. Beware of bats and spiders. Beware of adults who can't stop trick-or-treating. 
aren't you in your 40s? Aren't you in your 60s? I'm here with the kids. Sure, where are the kids? <laughs> Beware. In fact, we find these signs everywhere. Beware. Beware of dog. Watch out for our dog. Beware. Beware if you live uh, near water, uh, especially if you live uh, near the ocean or a big body of water. Beware of high tide. Beware of high winds. That can happen anywhere. Beware of falling rocks. That happened. I'd, I'd never seen a sign like that before moving out to the west. Beware of falling rocks. Oh, man. You know, I'm not even in the mountains. And I'm white knuckling it. Oh. How about this? You see these signs that are posted anywhere, like on your mower, and it just shows you a sign of a severed finger, like beware. Like, oh, I'm going to pull my hand back. Uh, on, on your electric panel, beware of electrocution. Don't stick your hand in there and root around and figure it out. No, don't do that. Beware. There are a lot of things to beware of in this life. In fact, I would even tell you this. As we get to communion today, in the passage of Scripture we always look at, 1 Corinthians 11, there's a beware moment. Beware that you don't approach this like, oh, it's just juice and crackers. Beware that you don't come to it like, ah, whatever that Jesus did. Beware that you don't come and just say, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, and I want to listen to Jesus. Beware. There's a beware moment. And we will read that together as we approach the table later on. But I want uh, us to see this. As we dive into the understanding of beware, let's open our Bibles, Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. We read it together already, but I want us to, to catch that beware understanding as it begins this way. Therefore, verse 16, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And it's a good spot to stop and to remind ourselves that what we hold in our hands, what we're going to interact with together today, what Josiah prayed that we would hear from the Lord, that what we have right here is the word of God for us. Amen? Amen. Let's just understand that. This is not like, oh, well, I can disagree with that. You can disagree that you don't like it, but that it's still God's word and it's for you. And if you don't like it, it means that it's probably conviction and the Holy Spirit working to say, hey, I want to show you something. So we look at this passage and we see that this passage, we want to be good students of God's word here. And we know every Christian has been given the Holy Spirit so you can be a good student of God's word. The Holy Spirit helps us to understand it. But one of the things we look at just as we look at grammar is that it begins with the word therefore. It's a summation word. Therefore, it's building on something that's already happened in the passage. And so we look back and we say, what was uh, the passage already teaching us that now we are building on. And we saw last week, okay, it was about being secure, being secure, being secure in God's love and what he's done. And now it leads us to this, and we have this understanding. Because Jesus has secured our victory, and he has, because he's defeated Satan and his demons, we are free to live for him. Because of what Jesus has done, he has not just said, now good luck to you. He said, I'm going to help you live. I'm going to give you life, and I'm going to help you live for me. We are secure in him. And that brings us to therefore, and it's now a warning. Beware of those who would pass judgment on you. And I just want to give you a big statement today that you would just get your arms around because this is happening in churches around the world a warning. Beware the church is under attack. By who? By false teachers. By those who would want to lead people away from Jesus and toward their own agenda. To, that would want to lead people away from the truth and into error. That, peop, uh, that would want to lead people away from freedom and back to slavery. Beware the church is under attack today from false teachers. These teachers show up everywhere. But you, Jason, you just said that Jesus has secured the victory. How can this be that false teachers still exist and that they're still at work? And I want to just help us understand uh, just theologically something about the issue of sin. At the cross, Jesus broke the power of sin. 
You can now say no to sin and yes to what God wants in your life because Jesus broke the power of sin. And yet, this is also true, the presence of sin is still here. It's real. It's in our world. All you have to do is turn on the news for a moment, for five minutes, and you will be convinced the power of sin is still real in our world. You say, wait, 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 wait. I'm, I'm trying to get my arms around this. Why wouldn't Jesus just deal with sin? Why didn't he just not only break the power of sin, but deal with it completely at that moment? Here's what happened. At the cross, Satan and his demons and sin and death have been sentenced. They've been sentenced. Doom awaits. Hell awaits. Satan and his demons, sin and death itself. But the sentence has not been carried out yet for our benefit. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it's not going to be on the screen for you. It says this, that God is patient with us, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. One of the reasons that that sentence hasn't been carried out yet is so that we can be brought into saving faith and have our sins forgiven. God is patient with us because when you say, go get sin, like it's somewhere out there. And we forget without Christ, sin is right here in us. It's the kindness of the Lord. And so we still see that God is at work, and yet, because it hasn't been dealt with completely yet, that day is coming. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. That the church is under attack by false teachers. I want to give you three traps today to beware of. If I said, watch out for that, and watch out for that, and watch out for that, that's what this passage does today. And I'm just going to give you a little heads up. This passage may step on your toes. This passage may bring conviction into your life. And if the Holy Spirit brings that to you, let him bring it. Because he's warning us. So let's begin with this. Number one, would you, if you're a note taker, get this. Beware the trap of legalism. Legalism, you can hear legal in it. You can hear law, legal law. It is when we are saying, I'm not going to live in freedom I'm going to live according to a list of rules. And if I do all of these things, that's when I'll truly be loved by Jesus. And if I do this and I do this and I do this and I do this, that's when I'll be a better Christian than you or you. Notice that I didn't point out here. (laughs) You're like, man, what's going on? Beware of the trap of legalism, doing, rule-keeping, trying to hone in on the moral law rather than finding freedom through faith in Jesus. Here's how it crept into the early church in Colossae, and it is still creeping into the church today in 2022, today. When we have false teachers who say this, yes, 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 you need Jesus, and fill in the blank. In fact, I want to give you a truth today. Here's the truth. Jesus, this is some math now, great math. Jesus plus nothing equals freedom. Jesus plus anything else equals slavery. Jesus plus nothing equals freedom. Like Jason, Jason said, that's not addition. You're right. Nothing should be added to the person and work of Jesus He alone can save. He alone can lead. He alone is the one that we need. He alone. Jesus plus nothing equals freedom. In fact, this letter written to the church in Colossae, that church, they needed to hear this. The big idea of this letter is the preeminence of Christ. What does that mean? The superiority of Christ. He's above all. You don't need Jesus and a list of rules. You see, these false teachers were like, yeah, yeah, that's good, but we have something better. That is insidious. You have something so good in Jesus, but we have something better. It's Jesus and. So here's the error of the false teachers. 
the legalists in the church of Colossae. In fact, you will see that the church was trying to be torn apart by Satan, and he will use legalism to do that. Here's the error. They were saying, it's your diet, Jesus, and your diet that matters. It's Jesus and special days on your calendar that matter. And if you observe the diet like I do, or the days like I do, then you will be a superior Christian. In fact, often they were saying this, we have some hidden knowledge that you don't have. Come and hear the hidden knowledge. Come to my seminar this afternoon. That's the error. Diet and days make you a superior Christian. In fact, I, I wanted to talk to you about these false shepherds. You know, it's Halloween tomorrow, and, and some of you are going to dress up. Some of you love to dress up. You're going to have people all over the place dressing up. They're going to dress up at work, and they're going to dress up up and down the street, and they're going to have trunk or treat events, and there are all these different things going on. People dress up. Some of them are going to dress up like robots. Wow, that's amazing. What a cool costume. And some are going to dress up like zombies. Woo, that's scary. And some are going to dress up like your favorite Marvel character. I always try to figure out what's the hot thing this year that people are dressing up like. What's the big one? But these false teachers, they have a disguise that they're wearing not just on Halloween. They're wearing something every day of the week, especially when the church was gathering. This disguise is that of a false shepherd, a teacher of teachers, somebody who says, I care for the sheep. And really what they're doing, though, is leading the sheep away from Jesus, leading God's people, since Satan can't have you back when you put your faith in Jesus, what he'd love to do is sideline you. He'd love to get you off course. He'd love to have you stay over here, get off the field and sit on the bench and just listen to all the false teaching. False teachers were dressed up like shepherds, dressed up like they cared, but really they have an agenda that is their own. Beware of this. Beware of somebody trying to pull you into following a specific diet or following certain days of the week. See, they they want to talk to you about rules and regulations. What was happening is that some of these folks come out of Judaism, or they were learning all the things that happened in Judaism, and they weren't even Jewish, and they got really into it. They were really into all the Jewish rules and regulations. They would say things like this, oh, you shouldn't have ham. That's forbidden. That's forbidden. That's, that's, that's bad. In fact, let's go one step further. You shouldn't just not only have ham. You shouldn't have meat. In fact, oh, wait, wait. Haven't you heard about Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, how they were taken into captivity in Babylon, and they told the wicked king, no, we won't have your meat and your wine. Just give us vegetables. You see, that's the true food of a Christian. It's just vegetables. Oh, this is the right diet. Follow what we say. By the way, that's happening today. Christians who say it's Jesus and your diet that make you a better Christian. It's Jesus and this that make you a superior Christian that can really hear the, the, the heart of the Father. That's legalism. In fact, I want to just touch on this thing with food. Jesus dealt with this area of food multiple times in the Scripture, but he dealt with one with the Apostle Peter who he had to get through to his mind, and it took a couple of times to say, it's not about the food. In Acts chapter 10, verses 14 and 15, God is speaking to Peter, and Peter is hearing and having this this, uh, amazing interaction by seeing this this vision that God wants him to see, and he's having this, this discussion back and forth with God And it says this, but Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten, hear that pride, anything that is common or unclean, not me, Lord. And the voice came to him again a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. So Peter's like, I, I, don't eat, I, don't, I, I don't eat anything that is not on the kosher diet. I don't eat anything that way. And God is saying, it's not about food. And it's not about race. It is about God's love. Stop getting off track. Jesus plus nothing, that equals freedom. But it's Jesus plus your diet, we have a problem. 
Now press into this. The false teachers were uh, speaking of legalism, emphasizing the rules, and they were also trying to chain people, and this is just a good way for you to visualize it, chain people to the calendar. Chain people to the calendar. It's Jesus plus observing all these special days throughout the year and how you live your life according to this very particular calendar, the lunar calendar, new moon, these festivals that show up throughout the year. If you're really a good Christian, you'll follow these. The Jews have followed them for centuries. Now you need to follow them too. Oh, you need to follow and, and follow the Sabbath. And if you haven't been around somebody who is a Sabbath keeper, the Sabbath keeper means that Friday night at sundown, that's Sabbath, and you are not to do anything until Saturday night at sundown. Listen, I have family members, people who have heard the good news about Jesus and got so into Sabbath keeping, they lost their way. They were into taping the light switches. I'm looking at the light switches at the back of the room. You're like, he's looking at me. Uh, taping the light switches. They're, they're running around the house taping light switches so that no work could be done on the Sabbath. And you're like, well, that's, that's crazy. Not according to a legalist. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it's the way that God would want you to live. Jesus plus anything is slavery, is missing the point, is not what God wants. Jesus plus nothing, freedom. Freedom, there's so much freedom, but people struggle sometimes with freedom, and so they take something they're passionate about and they attach it to Jesus. If you hear a Christian say this, we do it right. Watch out for that. If you hear a church that says, we do it right. Watch out for that. If somebody says, if you want to be a real follower of Jesus, you'll do this and this and this. It's like a Christian who is following Jesus on the journey of life, trading in their hiking shoes where Jesus leads them for a new pair of shiny shackles. But people are being invited every day. Legalism is saying Jesus plus our list of do's and don'ts. Jesus plus this. That, legalists would say, is what God wants you to do. Number two, second thing to beware of. Watch out for this church. I told you, like, ooh, man, here it comes. The second thing is probably the most prevalent in our society today. Beware of the trap of syncretism. Hear that word sync in it. A combining of things. The sinking of things. Beware of the trap of syncretism. Here's a good definition for syncretism. It's a noun. The amalgamation, the combining or attempted combining amalgamation of different religions, cultures, or schools of thought. In fact, picture it this way. If you've ever had like a get together and say, we're all going to, it's going to be a community stew. Bring your favorite ingredient, and we're going to all throw it in the pot, and we'll, we'll do this together. And somebody brings the potatoes, and somebody brings their spice, but they didn't just use a little bit of spice. What did they dump in? The whole thing. And somebody brought a dirty sock, and somebody brought gravel, and they threw it all in the pot, and you stirred it up, and you said, oh, taste it, and it's oh, so nasty. That's syncretism. Syncretism sounds wonderful, but it's really a mess. Here's what was happening in the church at Colossae with syncretism. Here's what's happening in our world with syncretism. Take a little bit of the culture. Take a little bit of what's happening in modern culture. Throw it in the pot. Take, take a little bit of maybe some Judaism. Throw it in the pot. Take a little bit of Islam. Throw it in the pot. Take a little bit of Buddhism. Throw it in the pot. Take a little bit of Hinduism. Throw it in the pot. Take a little bit of and you name it, any kind of religious thought, throw it in the pot. Oh, and just a dash of Jesus. That is happening all the time. I've got my own brand, my own version. Taste it and see that it's nasty. And yet, it feels right because we all got to contribute to it. Colossians 2, 18 and 19. Let me just show you what syncretism looks like for the Colossian church. 
Let no one disqualify you, verse 18. Underline that in your Bible, disqualify you. That's, those are very, very real terms. Disqualification. Insisting on asceticism, all the don'ts of this life, and the worship of angels, they were big into that. Going into detail about visions. I had a vision. Puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. That's false humility. And not holding fast to the head, that is Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. Here's the statement for our church that we would invite people to be a part of. Here's our our reason for existing. Here it is. Leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, the head. It's not leading people into a new version, a new way of faith. No, no, no. Leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. But here in Colossae and in so many places in our world today, here is this beware of syncretism. Let's just talk about the list of ingredients that went into their syncretism, into the pot. Some of the false teachers in their church were insisting on asceticism. Say no, say no, say no, say no to everything. It's all what you say no to. Deny yourself. I hear this in modern churches when they say, you know, sexuality is bad. Maybe you don't understand what God made good. Let's understand that correctly. Uh, Just say no to, uh, you know, deny yourself. Deprive yourself of sleep. You should be getting up earlier and earlier and earlier because, you know, you don't need sleep, but you need this. Read my new devotional. Insisting on asceticism. Then he goes on to worship of angels. I'm going to speak about that in just a second. But people are amazed when they understand there's, there's a whole invisible world that is around us and that angels are real. There are angels from the Lord and there are angels that are not from the Lord that follow the evil one who is an angel himself and they worship them. Listen, if you read your Bible... You will see if it's an angel from the Lord. There are several times where somebody fell down in front of an angel and the angel says, no, stop that. Worship the Lord alone. And it is like halting that right there. If an angel says, yes, worship me, then you know that is not of the Lord. Then I'm, I'm just going to talk about this leaning on visions that people that are having, I, I, just, I had this strong feeling I had, this, I had this dream that I, it came to me. All, I said, did you have Cool Ranch Doritos before you went to bed? Because those seem to give me amazing dreams. Maybe it's Cool Ranch Doritos and not the Holy Spirit. No, it was so real, Jason. Oh, it's so real. Oh, it had to be from the Lord. False humility. False humility. Here's what false humility is. Easy looks like. Oh, you know, I don't do that, and I don't do that, and I don't do that. And um, if you were more like me, do you see the false humility there? It's just pride with a better voice, a calming voice, but still pride. And finally, the last piece in this ingredient, nasty mix of syncretism, is refusing to listen to the head. It is looking at God's word and saying, no, mm -mm, I'm not listening to that. I have a distinct feeling in my heart. I'm going to let my heart lead me. Don't do it. The Bible says the heart is wicked. The heart leads you all kinds of ways off the path of following Christ. So here's the syncretism that's happening in the Colossian church. Does that sound like modern day world to you? It does to me. It's happening in China today. It's happening in South America today. It's happening in Europe today. It's happening in North America today. It is happening because the evil one wants Christians to be derailed. And therefore, he continues to flood with people with lots of religious experience into the church. See, well, what what was that about praying to angels? I was listening to uh, a sermon this week, and I'm reading commentaries, just trying to get my arms around this. And here's what uh, was happening in some ways in different times in church history where somebody says, I don't feel like 
Um, I can come right into the Lord's presence. I know that Hebrews says I can. I don't feel like I can because I know who I am. I don't feel like I can do that. And so I have been praying to my guardian angel. And my guardian angel delivers the message for me to Jesus who takes it to the Father. And so I've been doing that. Or this is how we would say it in modern day. I've been praying to my spirit guide. I met my spirit guide. Uh, through a time of trans, uh, just meditation and transformation in my own life, and I met my spirit guide, and so I pray to my spirit guide, and my spirit guide takes that message to Jesus, and that message from Jesus to the Father, and you're like, it was happening in the Colossian church, it's happening today. And here's where it gets very real for us. When somebody says, I don't feel like I could pray to Jesus, why would he accept me in that very, very intimate way? And so uh, I pray to Mary, and she, the mother of Jesus, tells Jesus, and Jesus then tells the Father. And I'm not trying to step on somebody's toes right now, but this is happening today. There are others that Christians are saying, I don't feel like I can pray to Jesus, and so I'm praying to my favorite saint. Maybe it's Peter, maybe it's Paul, maybe it's Michael, maybe it's Jerome, maybe it's Tito. He's lesser known. Um, uh, it sounds like the Jackson 5 to me. Um, but as I, I look at that, as we have any of those, the Bible would say that's not what the Scripture teaches. And so if this passage is stepping on your feet, and I know it was stepping on people's toes in the first service, and so I know it's stepping on some folks on your toes today, here's what I would just encourage you. Don't shh. Shush the Holy Spirit. Don't, don't try to silence God's word. If, if you have been led astray, repent of it. And come back because here's what Jesus would want you to hear today. Here's what he'd want you to hear. I love you. I accept you into my family. You can bring anything to me because I want you. I want you to be free. Follow me, be free. Let's go to the just idea about the visions for a moment. I think our, our world right now, our culture right now, has heightened your feelings. What do you feel? What do you feel? What do you feel? What do you feel? And that plays right into this idea of visions and dreams. This is a key understanding. Please get this. If you have a vision, a dream, a strong feeling that disagrees with the word of God, you're in trouble. Hear it again. If I have a strong feeling, a vision, or a feeling that disagrees with the word of God, you're in trouble. In fact, this is the truth. The spirit of God will never, 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 would you say never? Never, never disagree with the word of God. The Spirit of God will not disagree with the Word of God. But I had a, this, you, you don't understand. I had this dream. I had this vision. I had this strong feeling. I had this urge. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, will never disagree with the Word of God. And if it's disagreeing with the Word of God, beware. Yes? Beware. Number three today. Beware of the trap of asceticism. I realize we don't use that word a lot. Asceticism, here's what it means. It's a noun. Self-discipline and the avoidance of all forms of indulgence, typically for religious re reasons. That's asceticism. You say, well, where does it say that? Verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, spirits... They're into spirits big time there in Colossae. Why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Why are you submitting to all these rules? Why are you doing that? How about this one, verse 21? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used. According to human precepts and teachings, would you underline human the ways that these are, these are made up by people. 
These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and the severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Whew. Is he on fire today? He's on fire because Satan would love to distract you. Satan would love to derail you. Satan would love to tear a church or churches apart across the fruited plain. And legalism does it. And syncretism does it. And asceticism does it. Because it's an exchange of freedom for shackles. This just say no campaign, that's asceticism. Just say no. Just say no. If, it, if, it's, if it's fun, just say no. If it's, if it's wonderful, just say no. Here, here's a couple of things that people say just say no to. Just say no to R-rated movies. I, I, I understand that. I understand where it came from. But then what happened when all those Christians went to see The Passion of the Christ? I know it's an R-rated movie, but I know it is The Passion of the Christ, so i got to go see it. But weren't you into, like your rules said, just say no to R-rated movies? How about just say no to immorality and sexuality on the screen? How about say no to that? How about this? How about this? How about, but we got rules. Just say no. Just say no. That was too close to home, wasn't it? Just say no. Just say no to face cards. That could lead to a gambling habit. Just say no. Wait, man, we, we come up with rules for all kinds of things. If it's good, it can't be of God. Ascetic practices were really, really, really popular in the Middle Ages. Wearing hair shirts so that goat skin would be just pricking at you night and day, especially if it had some kind of like bug in it. <laughs> Follow, by the way, the story of Martin Luther, great reformer. In fact, this weekend is a powerful weekend for Reformation. You say, well, it's all about Halloween. I would do a little search in your history and see all the things that God has done. We, by the way, we do not give tomorrow to the evil one. Halloween, that belongs to Satan. Wrong. That belongs to Jesus just like every other day of the year. Let's not give it to Satan. That ought to get an amen. amen. All right? Some of you are like, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> you know it. Because you were taught this, just say no to Halloween. Halloween does not belong to the evil one. Don't give it to him. Don't give it to him. Ascetic practices popular in the Middle Ages. Shirts next to the skin of, of hair. Just, oh, make it. How about sleeping on hard, bed, hard beds or on the cement floor? Martin Luther did all these things trying to get close to God before he put his faith in Jesus. He tried them all. Whipping oneself when you sin. Speak, not speaking for days or even years. Going without food. Going without sleep. Just to make your life miserable so that you can hear from the Lord. And that you say, wow, well, I don't think you understand fasting. I don't think you understand these things. Let's understand it from the Bible, not according to what some false teacher told you. Like, wow, there is so much going on in this passage today. You're right, because Satan was after the church in Colossae. And he's after this church, and he's after every church that teaches the good news about Jesus. He does not want the good news to go out. And so if he can derail Christians, he'll do it. Beware. In fact, how this passage ends for us today, it says, you know, things can look spiritual. They can even feel very spiritual. But if they, if they lack the real power to change a person, it's not of God. Because the Holy Spirit has all the power to change people. All the power. I want to just give you a, uh, an example out of modern day religion. It's happening in our world today. You've probably witnessed it on the news or in a movie of some sort. In parts of our world, world, women are forced by men to wear what is known as a burqa. Head to toe, covering, 
Some you can only see a slit for their eyes. Some you can't even see their eyes because they have to wear the sheen and, and so that you don't get tempted. The whole reason that is done is so that men will not be tempted to lust. Let's make sure the women are draped head to toe so we can't see any of them, then we won't lust. Unfortunately, it has no real power to stop lust. Because here's what men think. I wonder what she's wearing under that. Hmm, I'm imagining what she's wearing or not wearing under that. See, the burqa fails to stop the lust that is found in someone else's heart. It's religion. And religion, legalism, syncretism, asceticism, lacks the power for change. So for us today, church, you say, this isn't somewhere else. This is right here. If today's passage stepped on your toes, I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to convict you of something where you have taken Jesus and then somehow... You've added and. Jesus plus this. If that is what you have combined, then you are not experiencing the freedom that you were intended to. And you're like, I don't like that, I don't like that, I don't like that. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Because we can be trapped by legalism. And we can be people who want to combine culture and the cross. And it just doesn't work in our pot of religious stew. Asceticism, it feels spiritual. But it lacks the power. The truth is, Jesus came to set us free. And that brings us right to communion today. I'm going to invite Pastor Darren to come and lead us in a time of celebrating what Jesus alone can accomplish. Be ready to celebrate the Savior, Pastor Darren. So it's super encouraging to know that we don't have to add to what Jesus has done. The temptation to add is always there, but... Uh, it's nice to know that I don't have to do the extra work because any extra work I do is useless anyway. So we come to the table like this and we reminded of what Jesus said to his disciples. And, I, and as, as Paul in, in 1 Corinthians, he was correcting their mess. Like the Colossians had their mess. The Corinthians had their mess. And so Paul was readdressing them and, and, and kind of, hey, guys, you're, you're losing sight of what the point of the whole Lord's Supper is all about. So we're going to do a little bit of a backstory. We're going to look in, at a, in a passage in, in 1 Corinthians where Paul tells these guys, hey, Let's just pause a bit and let's redirect, let's refocus on why we do the Lord's Supper. So that's not adding stuff to it. Let's remove all the junk away so you can finally focus on what Jesus actually did for us. So today, as we do this, we're going to read the passage. And as I read it, let it kind of remind you of what the point of the Lord's Supper is. And then as I finish, we're going to um, invite you to examine yourself, kind of do a self-check. What have you done to your understanding of what Jesus has done? Have you added stuff to it? Have you made some mistakes that are maybe is a barrier that I need to, I need to confess. I need to get, get some stuff out of the way so I can enjoy the sacrifice that Jesus did for me. So I'll read the passage. And if you have kids, we want you to just be available to take the, the cup and the juice to a spot. And you can circle with your family and do a little uh, uh, mom-dad instruction. That's totally okay. Kind of circle the wagons a bit and, and kind of let your kids know what this means to you. And then you can instruct them as well. And then when you're ready... Uh, you come up here, grab your cup, and you, can, and you can take it when you're ready as you kind of examine and the worship team will lead us in some worship. So let me read from, uh, this is 1 Corinthians 11. I'm going to start with verse 23. This is Paul talking. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he gave, had given thanks, he broke it and said, Jesus' words, he says, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Telling him to remember. This is a monument, remember. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks a cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Don't add to this. Don't subtract from it. Let it be what it is. Let a person examine himself and then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So we just pray for us. And then when you're ready, uh, don't rush up here. It's not like a rock show or anything. No, this is the time for you just to reflect, examine yourself, uh, and just bask in the awesomeness of what Jesus has done for us. Come up here and use the cup and the bread to remember that. And again, mom, dad, this is your chance to really uh, let your kids know how important this is to you. You take a corner of the room, sit in your chairs, and just enjoy the opportunity to teach your children what this really is. And for those who don't have kids with us, use this as an opportunity for teach yourself, to re-examine yourself, retell yourself the story of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you so much for what you've done. Uh, we apologize, at least I do, I know I apologize for when I neglect to remember the awesomeness of what you've done. We need to stand in awe of the cross. We need to remember that. We need to know uh, that it is something that is real. It really happened. It really hurt. And you really arose from the grave. So Lord, help us to understand what that looks like, what that means to us. Help us to examine ourselves, to apologize to you, to confess when we need to, to enjoy and to worship you when it's appropriate. And always remember that you, your body was broken, your blood was shed for us on the cross. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name.